to serve others. However, something in the your intention should be to listen, should be sincere and done from the heart. Only then it is fruitful. That's why we are here. Welcome to our first international multidisciplinary webinar series with the theme in rising beyond the pandemic, ensuring quality life towards integral development. To begin with, our opening prayer will be flashed in our screen, and this will be followed to our national anthem. Let us bow our heads and put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering all of us today. May you bestow your guidance and blessings so that we can enjoy and appreciate its significance in our lives. Bless everyone who are present here today, that each one of us may be able to share our knowledge, understanding, and wisdom for your glory and honor. May the various activities related to this event be a success through your intervention. We all ask of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Magandang umaga sa ating lahat! Welcome to our day two webinar this morning. So, our first plenary speaker this morning is no other than Professor Minsuwari Isbakolod. He is a Maed EA, uh, graduated with the degree of Bachelor of Secondary Education major in history at Emilio Aguinaldo College, Cavite last April 30, 2008. He obtained a degree in Masters of Arts in Education, major in Educational Administration at Philippine Christian University last July 3, 2021, and currently pursuing his Doctor of Education, major in Educational Management, with complete academic requirements at the same institution. Currently, he is a full-time assistant professor at National University Mall of Asia, Pasay City, under the College of Arts and Sciences, General Education Department, and holds different social sciences subjects such as Philippine politics and governance, readings in the Philippine history, the contemporary world, Ethics and National Yen course. So now, once again, I welcome Dr. Prof Professor, rather, Mensuwari S. Bakolod. Let's give All right. him a virtual class. Thank you, Ma'am Angel de la Cruz. Yes, once again, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, another session of the second international 
multidisciplinary uh, provide disciplinary webinar. This is our second day. You no, know? thank you so much on behalf of Authors and Writers Guild for rendering your time with us. Okay, So again, I will be presenting my short talk on how Beyond Books Publication Authors and Writers Guild um, ensuring and coping with the book, no? So napakahalaga na makita natin kung paano yung sistema ng ating uh, gagawin in publishing your book. Okay. Please um, present my PowerPoint presentation. For a moment, in the play lang yung acting presentation. Ma'am Irene and Ms. Ma'am Kaila, please present my uh, presentation. Thank you. Yes, po, sir. Yes, po, sir. Yes, po. Good morning sa ating 101 na participants from uh, different schools. Please do not also forget to answer after the webinar yung ating evaluation para sa, uh, for us to be able to get our certificate. Ayan, there you go. All right. So once again, good morning to our second webinar. I will be or allow me to present my very short um, presentation in relevance to book and writing stages or how Beyond Books Publication and the Authors and Writers Guild coping and learning no? our um, certain books, journals in Beyond Books Publication. Okay, next slide. Our objectives for today's webinar is it will be our uh, students, teachers, aspiring writers and other professionals will be understand and appreciate the basic concepts, which is the stage of writing a book or manuscript. And very uh, um, unfortunate tayo for us to know kung ano yung mga basic na kailangan natin malaman in coping or writing a book. Next slide. What is writing? We all know that writing, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> writing is a method of human communication that uses a collection of visible signs that are by convention connected to specific linguistic structure levels of forming your manuscript. Okay, next slide. Writing is an end standard set of markings or signs that represent the words or language are considered writing systems. In writing a book, it depends on your own ways, kung ano yung pipiliin mong uh, dialect or perhaps your expertise, kung fiction or non-fiction, but in something into writing, no, pagsulat, pagbuo ng isang libro, ng isang lathalain. Okay, so this is a set of marking signs and represent 
works. Okay, next slide. Writing also is, there is no secret method in the uh, method for writing a book. Okay, if you want to be publish your manuscript, if you want to write your book, wala namang secret method. The thing is, kinakailangan, you will be able to start writing your book step by step. Kasi in, uh, on the reality, napakahirap magsulat ng book. Hindi pala ganoon kadali yung pagsusulat ng libro. Mukha lang madali. Mukha lang kinapipaste. No? Let's say ganoon. Pero there is no secret for writing a book. But if you are passionate in writing a story, writing a fiction or non-fiction books or manuscript, there is no secret basta meron tayong um, focus or intended to finish and to start writing our manuscript. What you need is to modify the advice to fit your unique requirements and abilities. It's up to you. Kung ano yung the way or the motivation na pwedeng makultivate mo when you are writing your script, writing your manuscript, your news uh, type of writing, no? it ups to your passion, it's up to your abilities nasa sayo. If you have your unique requirements, if you're going to um, write your manuscript. Because many authors have found success in different ways. Yes. Iba-iba din yung ways into forming a book. Individually, group, pero dito sa Beyond Books Publication, we are encouraging you to have a collaboration in writing your manuscript and your book. Me, as an um, a published author of Beyond Books Publication, I made quantitative research um, design book, no? co-author, and then also the Philippine politics. There is no secret. There's important things is you have your passion na continuously, step by step, is magsusulat ka, magpo-form ka ng iyong manuscript or yung tinatawag nating libro natin. Okay? Then, however, the book writing process can be divided into roughly different stages. May mga publishing companies, iba-iba yung kaninang process, iba-iba yung stages. But in, in forming a manuscript, there is no secret weapon, uh, weapon there is no secret method. Basta mag gusto mong magsulat, gusto mong gumawa ng isang bagay na interesado ka, please do it now and start forming your manuscript, non-fiction or fiction types of writing or book. Okay. In Beyond Books publication, there is, or in my presentation, these are the session, no? Or the stages that we can um, apply when we are writing our manuscript or the book itself. Okay. Next step, or next slide rather. Stage number one. Next slide. So this is no in particular no it's up to you it's up to your abilities no depende sa iyo kung ano ang maaari maging step or procedure mo but you have to write a specific guide when you are writing your manuscript mukhang madali magsulat ng libro tama mukhang madali magsulat ng story pero napakahirap niya lalo na kapag you are not motivated and if that's not your passion may hirap ka bumuo kahit limang pages or ten pages pa yung story, hindi mo siya magagawa. In Beyond Books Publication, we are here to help you, to guide you, to convert all your manuscript into book. Number one. Stage number one in setting a manuscript, in forming and writing your script, manuscript or book, set up personal goal. Yan. We all know, we uh, do this, of course, for the promotions, tama? for our ranking. Set up your personal goal. For me, ako ang, uh, nung first time, nag ako ng book, the first goal ko is, gusto ko makita yung pangalan ko sa isang book. Diba? Napakaganda when you um, check, when you saw your name na nakasulat sa book. Probably, that is my personal goal. And the rest is history na kailangan mo siya dahil passion mo siya, gusto mo magsulat, ishare sa buong Pilipinas that you are writing your script, you are forming your book, set up your personal goal. Okay? Next. So, goals or you have to set them. Next slide, please. Be them 
reach them. Next slide. So this is how I see, this is how I form my goal. Balik po sa isang slide. So, uh, isa pa po. Yan. So that will be the form or setting your goals. Set mo siya, then gagawin mo siya, then maabot mo siya when you're finishing writing your manuscript. Set up your personal goals. Personal goal mo, kunita. Yes, may, may kita, may profit sa pagsulat ng libro. Totoo yan. Pero hindi lang ganun kadali magbenta ng libro, of course. But the first thing na namit mo, yung personal goal mo, na makita mo yung name mo doon, that will be your uh, goal and achievement already. The next thing is magbebenta ka na, no? magsishare ka na ngayon ng iba, then unti-unti naabot mo. And nakilala mo ang Beyond Books Publication, we are here to help you to publish your book and recognize you as a published author, na-reach mo na yung tinatawag na goal mo, which is makilala, nag-set ng iyong personal goal. Okay? Next slide. So, on the next slide will be the pictures. Ito yung mga books. Gusto ko nakakakita nito eh. I have in my um, um, table yung mga books ng ganyan. Napakaganda makita yung ganyan. When you uh, love writing and reading a book, na maganda sa pakiramdam na nakikita mo yung mga books. Na someday gusto ko din makita yung books ko, yung libro ko, yung aking script na nandiyan sa mga yan. So that is one way of my uh, uh, motivation. Into next slide, fiction, non-fiction, life story, poem, or lyrics, we can do all of those things. Basta meron kang personal goal na gusto mong simulan or gawin. Diba? For example, you want to publish your manuscript on a poem, pero ang pagsulat ng poem in any st stanzas, no, napakahirap. Akala lang natin is madali. Fiction or non, fiction napakahirap. Okay, next slide is under no, stage number one. In this stage four, setting up your goals. In this stage, take and consider your what you want to write or what do you want to achieve because writing takes a lot of time, effort to write a book which is a big project. Yes, no first time ako, nagsisimula pa lang ako sa industry in writing a book, napakahira. I have already, I start writing when I meet, uh, before I met uh, Beyond Books Publication, and then I am very thankful na publish yung Philippine uh, or politics and governance or Philippine politics and governance na aming isinulat pero napakahira. No? Then, so on and so forth. Because of Beyond Books Publication, because I um, felt that I am already recognized, doon na tuloy-tuloy na yung aking pagsusulat. I started writing in art appreciation, um, ethics, results, may nakaline up, malapit ko na siyang matapos. Basta meron kang purpose, goal in your self. No? Lahat yan, ma-reach mo siya. Yan. Pero napakahira. Yan. Kailangan lang natin is effort for us to be able to finish our script. Okay, next slide. Stage number two. When you're setting your goals. Okay? Please. Uh, mute your microphone, please. Thank you. Stage number two, set up working area. Yan. There's a factor also, or it must be considered, na yung working area mo. Tahime, malawak, lahat ng references mo is nandun. Okay? So next slide, you can see the picture. Yan, napakaganda. Huwag ganyan na set up um, working area mo. Ako sometimes, I go to... I go to coffee bin, no? I uh, see a spot there. Nag-i-step sa gumuni if makakapag-continue ako na environment, your ambience will be considered. When you are starting writing your manuscript, consider the working area. Next slide, stage number two comes to mind. When you consider the actual writing process, hear up when you start. Guys, please mute your microphone. Thank you.
But it's up to you. What will your ideal workspace look like and what equipment will you require? There is no requirement in, uh, in uh, writing a manuscript in your book. The important thing is your passion, your interest. Uh, but these are the stages that I consider in my presentation that will be help or it can be help para mag-boost natin, yung sarili natin to start writing and continue and reach our goal to meet, to publish our script or our manuscript, right? Next slide. Make a place for yourself to write. Ready? Um, and while some people work best in groups, wedding groupings, some authors need complete isolation. Gusto mo mapag-isa ha? Workstation options include a desk at home, a kitchen table, or a corner booth at the neighborhood coffee shop or locator room that is free of clutter so you can get into writing mode. Pero I'm telling you, it depends on you kahit maganda ang working place mo, kahit nag-set ka pa ng dool, pag hindi ka pa rin um, uh, interested, no, wala sa mood na mag-start writing, walang mangyayari. You can start writing your title, ang hirap pa din yun. Kahit title lang when you're writing your uh, manuscript, di ba? If you want to be published or recognized as a writer, saan ka magsistart? Ano ang gagawin mo? English, math, ano ba dapat? Ang, the secret is your interest, your passion to continue reach out, ma-reach mo yung iyong script na mabuo or you are into publish. Okay, next slide. Ayan. I want to share with you guys yung aking working place here in my room. Ayan. So malaking bagay pag nakikita mo yung mga working area mo na nandyan, it gives and support your stamina to write your manuscript. Ayan. So next slide or next stage, we're done setting up your goals, yung working areas. Next, set up the idea. What will be the idea? What will be the purpose? Ano yung mga needs or idea na dapat yung isunat? Ano yung mga things that you are need to consider? Next slide. The idea. Okay. You are in Starbucks. Nagko-coffee ka doon. Then right after na isip mo, I want to start my manuscript. What will be the content of your book? What will be your target? Next slide, please. On stage number three, in setting up the ideas, it is all about your idea in one main purpose of your book writing process. This stage is also defend on your target. Ano ba yung target mo? Once you formulate your idea, then write it. Ako, when I start writing Philippine Politics and Governance in Beyond Books publication, and I'm very thankful for to my also my, my, my uh, co-authors, I am the lead author and editor ng Philippine Politics na na-publish ng Beyond's book publication. What will be the content of your book? Lalo na sa sock side. Napakaraming content. Sino, ano ang sisimulan namin? But I see to it, I'll start na kaya kong gawin, tapusin, which is the Philippine Politics and Governance. And of course, the collaboration effort of my co-authors. Maghanap pa ng co-authors mo din, mahirap din. Hindi ganoon kadali. But I said, no, I mentioned earlier, if you have the passion to write, if you have the interest, ma-reach mo yung goal mo to finish your manuscript. Kahit kayo lahat, no, you are uh, listening to me. Okay, gusto ko din magsulat. Sige, what title? What book? Poem, story, fiction or non-fiction? Yes, maganda. May naisip ka. Sige, simulan mo nga ngayon magsulat ng introduction. And then, the next day, ano pa ang pwede mong ilagay? Then do something para magkaroon ng broad or expansion yung content or idea ng iyong um, script. That will be stage number three. Set up your ideas, then start to formulate. Buwin mo muna. Sulat mo muna. Right? Next slide, stage number four. When you are setting up your ideas, do a research. Write down all the ideas that you need to research. Bakit magre-research? Of course, kailangan re-align or i-align mo yung, yung content from different research 
authors, but you have to cite them. Ibang aspect naman yon. When you are doing and writing your script in your manuscript, and you are going to use other references, you can use other references, but see to it to cite them properly. Describe, write your script, write your manuscript in your own version, in your own understanding. It's not like that copy and paste, then enough, then cite the authors. It's not like that. You go into research a particular content based on your ideas, and then you are going to expand, interpret in your own understanding, in your own perspective. Do a research. It's, it is probably, or I advise, when you are writing your script, kailangan nasa harap ninyo yung mga books and references ninyo. And what will be the step? Basahin mo yung limang references na yun, basahin mo, then come up your own perspective and explanation. And the rest is history. That will be on the stage number four. Konti na lang, may research ka na. Next slide, please. Nakapaghanap ka na na limang books na reference mo na magiging guide mo. Kasi it is very important when you are writing your script, you know, when you are writing your fiction or non-fiction book or just like our books, the quantitative, qualitative, usually we do lots of research. You know, we are considering other research and then you're going to um, describe and explain, interpret in your own perspective. So that is on stage number four. Next slide, this, it is something how to develop a note-taking system. It is very important to note-taking. No? You have to note, you have to write based on the research, based on the other authors, and then it allows you to find the information you need at will. Yan. Use different studies or sources. The usual, no, yung mga IRL. Yan. If your book's goal is to entertain, educate, or but they call this titillate your reader. Consider how your information may be organized to do so. Organize your research. Right after you forming your ideas, no, meron ka ng idea, meron ka ng title, meron ka ng introduction, and then nag-research ka na five references, ten references, and then note-taking system is very important. No, You can copy... The particular content from other references, you have to cite it properly. APA, diba? APA format. And then you're going to identify kung ano yung best suit in your research or content na gagamitin mo and to be followed by your own explanation on the stage number four. Okay, next slide. On doing your research sa so stage number four, you have to consider first, napakarami kasi proseso when we are forming our script or book. Hindi lang ganun kadali. Right after the research, enough na ba yon? Enough na ba na may introduction ka? May table of contents ka na? May chapter 1 to 10 ka na? Na isulat mo na siya, right? Nakopya mo na sa iba and then nagform ka na ng mga ideas mo and then you're setting up and writing your ideas and content. Nag-note taking system ka na, gagawin mo ulit is you have to read. You have to re read your content. After ma-read or re-read, may mga revision, you're going to write again. No? Editing process. Then, na-edit mo na siya, nasulat mo na, magkakaroon ka ng draft. Drafting system. Kaya, it is very important to us to write the things kung saan ka magsisimula. Ano ang iyong uh, magiging focus? Art appreciation ba yan? Science ba yan? Biology and math? Fang management ba yan? History ba yan? Diba? Then, make an outline. No? Cross out the content na hindi mo na kailangan and to meet your objective sa bawat chapter na kailangan mong isulat. No? But, Anyway, it's up to you on how your abilities to form and writing your script. No, ito ay this only a guide. After outlining, no, rewriting naman, then revise. Napakahaba. There is a lot of process when you are writing. Akala mo na isulat mo na from chapter 1 to 5. No, For example, you have already the chapter 1 to 5. 
wow, napakasaya sa feelings. But when you go back to your chapters, basahin mo ulit yun, parang mali ito. Cross out. Okay, babalikan mo yung 5 to 10 references book na ginamit mo. Yan. Then right after na na-read mo siya, na-rewrite mo siya, then another revise. Napakarami po. Yung aming uh, book, no, Philippine Politics and Governance, which is I will be uh, presenting to you later, yung aming uh, book. Akala mo gano'n na siya, tapos na no, when you start writing. When you start collecting the chapters from your co-authors, ang hirap mag-revise. Yan. Diba? So next slide on this portion of writing your script, stage number five. No, let us assume that we are done already on the stage number one to four. You have your script already. Na-revise mo na siya. Okay, what will be the next procedure? The thing is, ipoprint mo na siya. Paano ko kaya makoconvert to? Gusto ko makonvert ng book. Yeah. And you meet Beyond Books Publication. We will be converting your manuscript into a book. Yeah. Yes. Ito na yung pinaka-exciting part. No? We will be converting your script, your story, your poem into a specific book. Yeah. So napakaganda. Konti na lang matatapos na tayo. No? So this stage number five. Next slide please. You could try to get traditional publishing route and find an agent. Uh, ako for me, based on my experience, no, akala mo, kapag na-convert na sa book, tapos na yon hindi pa pala. But more and more authors are turning towards self-publishing, like Beyond Books Publication. You can contact us and directly message me if you want to be one of the key authors on uh, history because my expertise is aligned to social sciences or history. You can uh, directly message us beyond books publication special no yung uh, if you want to be uh, recognized as uh, social science history author ng book yeah pwede natin yan pag-usapan because in the process of writing a manuscript or book pwedeng individual or collaborative mas maganda for me yeah, may collaboration kasi hindi mo uh, masyado ramdam you stress yung pagod kasi marami kayong magkakalab. When you are forming and deciding that you're continuing, you want to be published or recognized as a book author. Okay? Next slide. Ayan. So, na-convert na. On this stage, you can also consider the strategy or marketing plan for you to recognize. There is a lot of option naman. No? Maraming mga publishing company, pero Ang Beyond Books publication, we are very hands-on to help you. Pero syempre, may mga minimal fee. Wala namang free for publication. Okay? Next slide. Ayan. You can see on your screen, my uh, biggest achievement. Iba yung dating when you are done writing and concepting your book. I'm very grateful and honored to be part of this Authorship, Quantitative Research Design, Philippine Politics and Governance. This will be my first and major project na nagawa na set in Beyond Books Publications. And my plan for this year, I want, uh, may plan talaga ako, may goal na I, uh, I want to publish a book, at least five books. no? And then the rest, ongoing na. Nagsisimula akong Sana matapos ko yung art appreciation and other books. Pero hindi ganun kadali. Okay? Pero step by step, consider yourself, no, informing your script, your manuscript, step by step procedures lang ang kailangan. Hindi mo kailangan biglain yung sarili mo to finish from chapter 1 to 10. Okay? Yan. Next slide, st uh, stage number 6. Ayan na. Na form na, na, na convert na yung manuscript into book, but yan books publication, ready for launching. For new uh, members, no, yung mga uh, participants natin today, students, teachers, and other professionals, these are the guide. So ready for launching. For you to able to feel no, na maramdaman mo na you are already a recognized author, and in Beyond Books publication, we cater book launching. 
Okay, next slide. You must first make people aware of your book. Siyempre, nabuo mo na yung book mo, yung manuscript. Na-convert na ng book. Kailangan mapalaganap sa buong Pilipinas ang iyong libro. Para naman, siyempre, ma-share mo sa kanila yung iyong book and kung gusto mong ma-monetize. No? Beyond Books Publication capable of advertising your book, we do that in Beyond Books Publication. Produce and promote your masterpiece. Use a tailored marketing approach that is suited for your book's category and target audience to get notice. But on this stage, no, isa din to sa mahirap na stages when you want to uh, popularize as a book author. But the important thing is you convert your manuscript into a book, libro na siya, then your plan to more expand your popularization, kailangan mo talaga mag-undergo ng book launching para ma-notify ka o ma-notice ka, ma-meet mo yung mga audience mo, readers mo, kung sino yung gagamit ng iyong book. So this will be the final stage of writing or manuscript. Next slide, I want to share with you yung book launching na naganap in Pampanga. I'm from Cavite, then I travel from Pampanga for us to recognize no, yan, yung Insight for Sites, ng magazine, international magazine, ng Beyond Books Publication, may journal din tayo. No? Next slide. Ito'y naman yung mga books. Ayan, nakakatuwa, nakakataba ng puso na makita mo yung libro mo, pinagpagura ninyo from couple of months na na-fully recognized ka na as a author and writer. Alright? Next. Ayan. Next slide, please. Ayan, so see, napaka-overwhelmed ng recognition na to as an author. Next slide. So in my presentation, I already met the six stages of the presentation. Number one is setting up your objectives or personal goal, di ba? Stage number two, set up your working area. Agayan. Stage number three, set up the idea, the content of your script. And then stage number four, you are, you are going to do a resource, maraming resource ang pagsusulat eh. Hindi lang basta makita mo sa Google or other platform. Do a research. Maraming mga authors or books na pwede mong gamitin as your references. Stage number five, after, you, after your research, and nag-write down ka na, nag-draft ka na, na-revise ka na, Convert your manuscript into book, book rather, and number six, ready for book launching. So that will be all my presentation today. So next slide is the references that I used in my uh, presentation. If you have any questions, no, pwede nyo pong isulat sa ating chat box or like after ng ating uh, um, mga speakers, they talk magkakaroon tayo ng open forum or question and answer portion and sasagutin namin yan sa abot ng aming makakaya. So that will be all. Thank you for joining and mabuhay po tayong lahat. Alright. Ang dami kong natutunan kay Prof. Mensawari. So as I uh, listen from the first slide to the last slide, I really grasp uh, everything wherein this is how you do it. You sit down at the keyboard and you put one word after another yes. until it's done. It's that easy and that hard. So thank you for that presentation, sir. And I also inspired to do or thank write you. my own book. So thank from you, the participants, any question? And how to write your book also? Ayan. Thank you so much sa mga nag-react. Thank you, thank you guys. If you any inquiries or concern, questions on how to write and start writing your book,
pwede namin kayo tulungan. In particular, in any areas naman, we can suggest you sa mga kasama natin, lalo na yung mga ating uh, participants na bago lang, no, try to like and share yung aming Facebook page, YouTube, para you are update no, kung ano yung mga possibilities projects ng Beyond Books Publication and Authors and Writers Guild. Alright? And thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. That will be all. So let's now proceed for the next um, guest or keynote speaker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Wari. And let us present the certificate. Kindly move to the next slide, ma'am. So, certificate of recognition is awarded to. Nancy is McCullough for being one of the plenary speakers during the day two of the first international multidisciplinary webinar series of authors and writers guild, the Yan Books Publication, August 26 to 28, 2022, with the theme Rising Beyond the Pandemic, given the 27th day of August. 2022 at Bebe Pampanga. Signed, Dr. Moha Na, SPI, MPD, Faculty, Leonardo, also, PhD, and Books Publication, CAO, and signed Professor as the name. I'm so sorry. As strength me and this company Athens is presentation, presentation sir Mr. Wari as Bakola. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you. Fun books publication, authors and writers still members. Thank you so much. Sir. So now let us proceed to the next plenary speaker, Professor. Wendelo Futalan Garcia, PhD in Humanities, HC, PhDC, MN, RN, LPC. She is currently connected to Senior High School Department at San Vicente Pilots for Philippine Craftsmen, SD of Pagbanga. And she is a master teacher one. And she is also related to other assignment as a school research coordinator, senior high school subject group head, and taught research subjects, science subjects, and she is at the Maghetti City Negros Oriental. So for her educational background, he earned her professional teaching certificate at UP Open University and System Plus College Foundation for her Bachelor of Second of Science in Nursing minor in Psychology. She attained this at Saliman University and for her Master of Science in Clinical Psychology with 12 units at the La Salle University, Manila and earned PhD in Education, major in Research and Evaluation with Indian units at UP Diliman and Master in Nursing at AUF. She also earned PhD in Nursing Major in Educational Management and Leadership for Comprehensive Examination, HAU, and she earned her Doctor of Humanities, HC, at the University of Oklahoma, USA. For her work experience, she is a Master Teacher One, a University Professor, a Nurse Instructor, Acting Chief Nurse and Nurse Supervisor, Nurse Instructor, and a Staff Nurse. And for her professional affiliation, she is connected to Sigma Tim International Honor Society for Nursing, Psi Beta Chapter, Central Luzon Health Research and Development Consortium, Philippine Council for Health Research and Development, Association of Deans of Philippine College of Nursing, Psychiatric Mental Health Nurses Association of the Philippines, Philippine Nurses Association, New York Academy of Science STEM Global Mentor, 
International Network for Doctoral Education in Nursing. Four, personal affiliation. She is connected to Order of Eastern Star Callao Chapter Number no. 9 and Rotary International District 3790. And she was awarded and recognized as the 12th place Philippine Nurse Licensure Examination and 20th place Philippine Licensure Examination for teachers in secondary. Now help me welcome Wendelo Futulan Garcia, PhD in Humanities, HC, PhD, CMN, RN, LPT. Let's give her a virtual clap. Good day, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be part of this wonderful undertaking. And I would like to thank Beyond Books Publication for this opportunity. In these times where anything and almost everything is quantifiable, the more we need to exert effort to describe the quality of human experiences and social situations to grasp a deeper meaning of each unique phenomenon we encounter in our daily lives. And that's where qualitative research comes into play. My name is Wendy Lou Futalan Garcia, a registered nurse, an educator, and a researcher. We might ask ourselves, what is qualitative research and how does it benefit us? Qualitative research is a type of scientific research. In general terms, scientific research consists of an investigation that seeks answers to a question. It systematically uses a predefined set of procedures to answer the question. It collects evidence and produces findings that were not determined in advance. A scientific research produces findings that are applicable beyond the immediate boundaries of the study. Specifically, qualitative research seeks to understand a given research problem or topic from the perspectives of the local population it involves. It is especially effective in obtaining culturally specific information about the values, the opinions, the behaviors, and social contexts of particular populations. Some examples of qualitative research are the following. An example of a phenomenological approach would be the lived experiences of senior high school students during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the researcher seeks to investigate and describe the unique experiences of senior high school students, what they went through, what they did, and how they coped being students when they were suddenly forced to take on unique learning modalities that were totally different from what they were used to. Another example would be the ethnographical approach of qualitative research, where the researcher aims to explore and describe the culture of a small community whose lives have been severely affected and changed by a traumatic and widely destructive volcanic eruption in 1991 by closely looking into one of its significant festivals, the Makatapak Festival in Bacolor, Pampanga. Another example would be 
a historical approach into the evolution of Philippine politics. What can we learn from qualitative research? The strength of qualitative research is its ability to provide complex textual descriptions of how people experience a given research issue. It provides information about the human side of an issue, that is, the often contradictory behaviors, beliefs, opinions, emotions, and relationships of individuals. Qualitative methods are also effective in identifying intangible factors such as social norms, socioeconomic status, gender roles, ethnicity, and religion, whose role in the research issue may not be readily apparent. When used along with quantitative methods, Qualitative research can help us to interpret and better understand the complex reality of a given situation and the implications of quantitative data. Although findings from qualitative data can often be extended to people with characteristics similar to those in the study population, Gaining a rich and complex understanding of a specific social context or phenomenon typically takes precedence over eliciting data that can be generalized to other geographical areas or populations. In this sense, qualitative research differ slightly from scientific research in general. What are some qualitative research methods? There are three most common qualitative methods out there. The first of which is called the participant observation. This is where the researcher immerses himself in the participant's natural environment and observes the participants of the study without interfering in their normal routine or daily activities. In-depth interviews are optimal for collecting data on individuals' personal histories, their perspectives and unique experiences, particularly when sensitive topics are being explored. Focus group discussions are effective in eliciting data on the cultural norms of a group and in generating broad overviews of issues and concern to the cultural groups or subgroups represented. Focus group discussions can be had with a maximum of 10 participants at a time where the researcher facilitates the discussion, asks questions, and hears out the participants' responses. This, however, has a setback when one or two participants are shy and others are too expressive. This calls for the researcher to be skillful in handling different personalities and maneuvering the discussion well to collect useful and relevant data and to achieve the objectives of the focus group discussion. There is another qualitative method that qualitative researchers use, and this is called the document analysis. 
Researchers can gather useful data from print documents like newspapers and magazines, as well as electronic records for which there is already an abundance, which is the click of our fingertips. Careful analysis is needed, though, to draw conclusions from the body of related documents that is available to the qualitative researcher. Document analysis is particularly useful in the conduct of historical research where finding primary resources is challenging or difficult to find. What forms do qualitative data take? The qualitative researcher can take down notes of the interview. This is called field notes. However, it is worthy to note that the researcher doesn't take down notes during the interview, but rather must jot down notes right after the interview. This is done to maintain spontaneity during the interview and to be able to record everything while it is still fresh in the researcher's mind. Field notes are written observations recorded during or immediately following participant observations in the field and are considered critical to understanding phenomena encountered in the field. Transcripts must be verb verbatim in order to capture the essence of the participant's unique perspective or experience. This is where audio or video recordings come handy for the researchers memory could fail and not remember everything. Of course, audio and video recordings should only be done with a participant's permission. What are qualitative research design approaches? There are five common design approaches. The first, is called the historical study. A historical study is an ideal choice for studies that involve extensive examination of the past, including people, events, and documents. The purpose of a historical study is to draw conclusions about the present and future based on research conducted in the past. This model depends on adequate interview sources and historical documents. It is essential to validate the accuracy of the data and find primary sources. Depending on the goal of the researcher, this form of study may result in a biography, which is why the term historical study is sometimes used interchangeably with biographical study. An example of a historical approach would be the evolution of Philippine politics. There are still people we can find to interview about what happened, for example, in 1986 during the EDSA revolution. Another common design is phenomenology. Phenomenology is a wide-ranging form of study. In this research model, the researcher looks to gather the information that explains how individuals experience a phenomenon and how they feel about it. This model recognizes that there is no single objective reality. Instead, everyone experiences things differently. The outcome is described from the point of view of the participants. However, 
the researcher is still able to derive a set of findings that can be used to identify themes surrounding the phenomenon under study. An example of a phenomenological approach would be the lived experiences of senior high school students during COVID-19 pandemic. Another common design is the grounded theory. The purpose of grounded theory is to develop a theory surrounding a social issue. This theory seeks not only to identify problems in social scenes, but also to define how people deal with those problems. Grounded theory is unique among qualitative design approaches because it depends solely on the data gleaned through the research process. Often, the initial research question is progressively reformed and refined as more information is gathered on the topic. In this sense, the participants help shape the study. An example of a grounded theory approach is grounded theory approach to understanding the student perceptions of asynchronous high school learning environments. The fourth common design is ethnography. Ethnography is the study of a specific grouping within a culture. Researchers pursuing this study format will immerse themselves into the culture they are researching. The qualitative data is gathered through direct observation of and interaction with participants who belong to that culture. The, the information is then presented from their perspective. Ultimately, this study aims at understanding group culture. An example of an ethnographical approach is the Makatapak Festival in Bacolor, Pampanga. The fifth common design is the case study. Case studies, one of the most common qualitative designs, are used to examine a person, a group, a community, or institution. Researchers often use a bounded theory approach that confines this case study in terms of time or space. To conduct the case study, the researcher may draw upon multiple sources of data such as observation, interviews, and documents. All participants chosen must share a unifying factor, which means they all must have a direct or indirect connection to the research question or subject being studied. After collecting the data, the researcher will analyze it to identify common or prominent themes. An example of a case study approach is internet use in a senior high school, a case study. I would like to end my talk with this thought. The key to success in qualitative research is to be mindful of the objectives of the study, being objective and determined.
As Albert Einstein once said, and I quote, everything that can be counted does not necessarily count. Everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. For the references that I used for this particular uh, talk is being flashed on the screen right now. Thank you and good day. All right, thank you, Dr. Wendelou. So for the next, Okay, so let us have our Q&A portion. Anyone who asks, who want to ask some questions or insight about what they gain from the talk of Professor Windelow. So one thing I learned from the talk is that research is a formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. So that is a thing that I really uh, note for me to have an idea of qualitative research as an overview given by our speaker. So now let us present the certificate of recognition. Certificate of recognition is awarded to Wendelo F. Garcia for being of the plenary speaker during the day two of the International Multidisciplinary Webinar Series of Authors and Writers Guild, BN Books Publication, this August 26 to 28, 2022, with the theme Rising Beyond the Pandemic, Ensuring Quality Life Towards Integral Development, given this 27th day of August 22 at Makabebe, Pampanga. Signed, Dr. Mohaina SPDIM PD, Faculty University in Indonesia. Signed, you know, because PhD, CEO, President, signed, Mekolod, Authors and Writers Guild President, signed, Professor Ranhel Lefko, Chernomhi and Space Company, Athens, Greece. Thank you, Dr. Windelow, if Garcia. Yeah. Congratulations. So now, let me welcome our next Keynote speaker, Professor Rania Lumpo, Astronomy and Space Company, Alex Salamis, Athens, Greece. Ma'am, welcome and let's give her a virtual club. A warm greetings from Greece. Can you hear me? Yes, Paul. yes, ma yes, ma'am. We can hear you. First, I would like to congratulate the uh, Beyond Book Publication for organization of this um, wonderful webinar series. And of course, I warmly thank uh, Dr. Leonilo for his uh, always kind invitation. I'm Rania Lavo. I'm a multi awarded uh, global educator, uh, STEM instructor. Um, ICT teacher trainer, uh, researcher, speaker, and author of scientific books for kids. I'm uh, currently working at the Greek Music Education, where I'm writing STEM projects for Greek schools, and also at the Greek Astronomy Space Company, uh, where I work as uh, ICT teacher trainer and uh, STEM, uh, where I'm writing STEM projects. So um, today, uh, we're going to explore the notion of VUCA. Uh, VUCA is an acronym uh, which stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. What's that uh, could characterize the new normal? 
this notion is gaining popularity as a term to cover the various dimensions of this uncontrollable environment. And in the second part, uh, we will describe uh, the curriculum of the fifth industrial revolution and the role of STEM education in this new curriculum. In the third part, uh, we're going to see how uh, artificial intelligence uh, transforms the educational sector because artificial intelligence has uh, the potential to address some of today's most pressing educational issues, reinvent and innovate teaching and learning practices, and as a result, uh, it could accelerate the progress towards sustainable development goal four, which concerns the world education. However, these rapid uh, technological advancements, of, of course, inevitably carry with them multiple risks. So, may I share now my presentation? Can we make? Can you see my presentation? Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you see also the change of slides? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so um, we said that VUCA is the acronym that stands for uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, qualities that make a situation or condition difficult to analyze, respond to, or plan for. So understanding how to mitigate these qualities can greatly improve the strategic abilities of a leader or educator and lead to better outcomes. What is volatility is the quality of being subject to rapid and significant changes and um, small triggers may result in large changes. Um, uncertainty occurs when events uh, and outcomes are unpredictable. The cause and effect are not well understood, and previous experience may not apply to the situation. Complexity involves a multiplicity of issues and factors, some of which may be intricately interconnected. Relationships between items and people are difficult to understand because a change in one place may cause identical changes to other things down the line. And why ambiguity is shaped by the lack of clarity and difficulty um, understanding uh, exactly what the situation is. Uh, these are uh, questions that are related with uh, uh, VUCA. VUCA. The proper use of VUCA is to apply to a situation to help uh, quantify tasks and create mitigation strategies. So use the VUCA method to go through what is known and not known about the situation or plan. This uh, helps uh, create better understanding of the situation and what the vulnerabilities and the risks are. So using VUCA can help uh, leaders manage the ever-changing uh, modern uh, uh, landscape, working place landscape. So these are the following questions. Uh, for what are the highest and lowest possible values that we can accept? How fast can these values change? Uh, and what amount of change can we absorb? What can change? What are the potential signs of change? Uh, how well do we understand the structures involved? How are the items interconnected? And what is uh, uh, the possibility for misunderstanding and uh, uh, confusion? This uh, acronym of uh, VUCA was first uh, used uh, in the context of leadership uh, theories. So the USA Harmony originally used the term to refer to the increasingly um, world uh, following the Cold War. Uh, the way people respond to VUCA depends, of course, on a number of factors, including individual differences, state differences, uh, such as stress, uh, environmental context, and people who are less anxious about change uh, are completely informed in uh, mental models. Function usually be better in changing environments than those 
those who show a high anxiety. Um, so, and increasingly, what can be perceived as either challenging for patients to um, have skills and safeguards and tools to adapt to the environment. And we'll know how humans can be um, adapted to a change. Um, and um, Usually, in uncertain or um, um, volatile environments, previous uh, decisions and the models of the line of decision may no longer be effective. So, a healthy approach in these circumstances is to adjust uh, um, uh, the weighting of previous assumptions and allow future decisions to be guided by feedback from the environment. Um, and um, the same, uh, uh, the same way, arousal responses are uh, properly attuned to the uncertainty of the world, they're better at learning. Um, so uh, we can see how Western society, for instance, is predicated on the notions of individual liberty and personal responsibility. Uh, both uh, concepts rely on the idea of agency. When we talk about agency, is what the individual can make, can make their own uh, choices and act uh, accordingly. Because um, um, in this way, we uh, should uh, uh, call the question, is it possible to prepare for the unknown? It's not too useful for them to try and learn, for instance, uh, friends or to hike through the mountains. So they cannot, uh, by definition, prepare with specific skills since there is no context uh, for def defining what specific skill will be valuable. They can, on the other hand, uh, prepare themselves in another way. They can equip themselves uh, with the states of mind, with strategies and the self-efficacy required to learn the new skills, uh, to learn the structure of the new culture and learn also the new uh, language so that they are ready to adapt when they arrive destination. So how might society and education systems provide a genuine uh, sense of agency to people dealing with an increasingly dynamic and changing world? Um, for example, when we walk into a classroom and we present a new material, um, this uh, uh, exposes the students' perspective uh, uh, to, to uncertainty. So if the material in the classroom is seen as not threatening and man has a sense of agency and self-efficacy in learning material, then a positive learning experience can occur. Uh, so by analogy, we can say that VUCA situations that occur naturally in the world or in education can also be opportunities for learning. Because when there is uncertainty, there is also something new to understand. Um, in this uh, way, we can foster our ability to learn uh, and uh, uh, to invent a viable solution. So learning to learn is also valuable because it remains uh, a key challenge for artificial intelligence also. Uh, we have seen many specific domains, machines already outperform humans. Um, so how can society be structured uh, to incentivize these lifelong uh, learners? Um, we talk about uh, uh, a lot of how uh, we are on the threshold of the fifth industrial revolution. Um, uh, we are already uh, we are already now in the uh, fifth, uh, the fourth industrial revolution with artificial intelligence, with uh, uh, robotics, uh, with big data, Internet of Things, or this also. And um, the impact on jobs and industries that these tools are creating is uh, huge. Um, however, um, we need to redefine the curriculum um, because um, futurizing education and building a, a workforce for the price 5.0, we need a more robust professional framework. Education plays an important role, of course, in ensuring the skill readiness of the labor force. And um, uh, we need uh, to ensure that our students and uh, the teachers um, alike get the best possible teaching learning experience. Uh, unfortunately, still today, most of schools and colleges are uh, uh, still teaching the same subjects in traditional ways. Um, so um, 
Any discussion on the future of work should go hand in hand with uh, a discussion on the future of curriculum and uh, about those who will deliver it. So in the education um, system of the future, the role of teachers, of course, will be more this of a facilitator, enabler of personalized growth. And this uh, will require a massive transformation in their approach to focus more on what we call an outcome-based teaching instead of continuing with traditional ways. Um, and this transformation must also include key areas uh, such as employability, student experience, research excellence, uh, societal impact and benefit for the industry. So that this learning does not need the instructor-led educational models, but we should to engage uh, through multiple sources of knowledge at its own pace. So uh, Industry 5.0 has a lot of opportunities for academic institutions to upgrade themselves to the next level, uh, for shaping the expectations of students to meet the challenges of the future academic institutions. We need to design collaborations. Universities, colleges, research centers, government agencies um, uh, needed to collectively get involved in the process. Modern learning cannot happen uh, without modernizing delivery. Faculty 5.0 should go hand in hand with curriculum 5.0. Um, learners, uh, learning outcomes should be based on personalized adaptive learning techniques, intelligent digital assets should guide teaching concepts, and to teacher student um, interaction should be based on smart approach to make uh, the whole experience engaging and interesting. Um, so, we are faced with the challenge of um, redefining the foundational uh, foundational uh, education in order to keep up with the evolution of skills required to solve problems, innovate, and succeed. Because as a society, I think that we fail we, we are failing to meet this uh, challenge, um, and uh, consequently we are failing to adequately prepare the next generation for the future. So how can education training providers keep pace with this unprecedented level of change? How um, can uh, how will future generations thrive in this changing landscape? Um, how uh, does a future-proof curriculum look like? Uh, reshaping, of course, uh, a curriculum is uh, a considerable challenge uh, because this implies usually complex uh, decision-making processes and various administrative obstacles, um, because as I said before, many uh, institutions are uh, still dominated by traditional approaches. Um, on the other hand, our globalized world needs a more active education system, um, enough robust to meet every challenge. And uh, this, of course, will require gradual efforts um, from academic leaders uh, and, uh, of course, with the support and involvement of the government. At the policy level, structural changes in the systems uh, might uh, um, have to be worked out. So when we talk about the curriculum, we have usually three uh, uh, axes. Uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, the content. Of course, uh, we need to upgrade the technical side of uh, the curriculum. And, um, and this means that we need to upgrade to accommodate the learning of mix and race robotics, static manufacturing, smart materials, um, and the need to think, but at the same time, to integrate non technical disciplines in the curriculum in order to develop cross cutting competencies and mindset beyond technical uh, expertise. Uh, that could be um, communication, for instance, or project management, or arts, or marketing. Um, we need at the same time pay special attention to the questions of ethics, social inclusion, diversity, and sustainability. That means that we could, it's essential to uh, incorporate um, and integrate sustainable development goals uh, into our classroom, uh, such as they described in the 2030 Agenda of the United Nations. So we need to uh, adopt, uh, in any case, a holistic approach. The second um, part is what we call the learning environment. And this learning environment includes uh, um, uh, how to apply problem or challenge-based learning or uh, project-based learning or inquiry-based learning, especially when we talk about STEM education. Um, why? Because we move towards the paradigm of lifelong learning, so we need to involve and occupy new roles in the ecosystem. Um, and um, 
uh, we need to, to uh, stimulate creativity um, and uh, help uh, um, students instead of, instead of focusing on uh, uh, standardized thinking, on correct answers and objectivity of judgment, we need to create a learning environment that will stimulate creativity and uh, forming of own opinion and diverse interpretations. In any case, create a culture that accepts potential failures and uh, develops the ability students to turn those failures into valuable learning experiences. Create um, um, learning environments that offer experiences relevant to uh, real world uh, problems, authentic real world conditions, um, such as the conditions that uh, students will uh, face um, later in their life. Uh, and um, um, encourage collaborative learning or stimulate technology enabled learning. So, um, talk about uh, two patterns of uh, collaboration. Um, and when we talk about uh, uh, these new patterns, um, uh, this means uh, that um, um, different types of collaboration are needed to ensure a multitude of experiential opportunities, including collaboration with companies. That could be um, manufacturers or technology providers or startups or other educational institutions via joint platforms or thematic networks or peer-to-peer -peer learning um, or governments, community, etc. So we need to further increase uh, university industry collaboration to acknowledge the role of industry partners as educational research and employment partners to create more opportunities for exchanging experiences with other educational institutions to peer-to-peer learning to enable learners to learn with and from each other, create effective learning ecosystems that could engage all key stakeholder groups and shift from human-machine interaction towards human-machine collaboration. What are the new trends in education is, uh, first of all, we have seen already during the COVID pandemic, um, how learning can be taking place anytime, anywhere, uh, how e-learning tools offer great opportunities for remote self-paced learning, um, flipped classroom approach also plays a huge role as it allows uh, uh, interactive learning to be done in class with theoretical parts to be learned outside the class time. How learning is personalized uh, because uh, students will be introduced to harder tasks only after a certain mastery level is achieved. So more practices will be provided if the instructors see a need in it. Positive reinforcement are used to promote positive learning experience and boost the students' confidence about their own academic abilities. Students should have uh, a choice in defining uh, how they want to learn. Uh, very important. Uh, and uh, because when you take into consideration their needs, their interest, their rhythm, students should be exposed to more projects uh, based on to more, to more what we call hands on uh, activities. Uh, and of course, we talk about new methods of assessment. Um, especially when we talk about online learning. So uh, competitive state-based skills uh, in this uh, uh, model of economy, because uh, as our economy shifts to more knowledge-intensive industry models, so we must meet existing demand for skills. Um, we need uh, state-based skills, um, and uh, um, we need uh, um, uh, STEM projects because for STEM projects focus on acquiring student-led investigations to open up real-life problems and hands-on activities empower students to become out-of-the-box thinkers and creators. STEM is related to inquiry-based learning, and this is the process of identifying problems, doing experiments, collecting alternatives, designing investigations, uh, developing conjectures, and um, uh, the main science inquiry process it uh, includes um, uh, orient, uh, uh, ask questions, generate hypothesis, plan, investigate, analyze, explore creative models, and predict. Here we can see the five model engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate. We have also uh, the seven um, by, uh, emo, uh, model, uh, which includes investigate, record, discover, think, try, reflect. When uh, the there is a scientific model usually behind this uh, inquiry um, uh, uh, question when students investigate a scientifically oriented question. Um, when students keep out evidence, analyze, explanation, connection, communication, uh, and uh, finally reflection when students reflect on the inquiry process they uh, learn. Of course, system education reflects the 21st century skills. We will know about creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, 
And uh, um, STEM educated uh, students are usually those who are problem solvers, innovators, uh, inventors, self reliant, logical thinkers, and technologically literate. If uh, we add uh, A in the acronym STEM, we have STEAM, a wide STEAM, because we need to emphasize the value of art skills alongside, to, uh, alongside uh, uh, skills, uh, technical skills, or entrepreneurial skills. Because uh, uh, creativity or design should go along uh, with uh, uh, technical skills, we need blended skills uh, in order to meet uh, the challenges of uh, our new globalized world. So STEM approach is an interdisciplinary approach that aims to promote research spirit, logical thinking, social skills, empirical inquiry learning, autonomy arts integration, and active participation of students. Uh, why arts? Because uh, art can promote political skills, social skills, a positive school environment, uh, reading and uh, writing uh, uh, skills. Um, and uh, uh, here we can see uh, what is the difference between transdisciplinarity, uh, disciplinarity, uh, multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. Um, how multidisciplinarity includes subject-specific concepts and skills that are learned separately in each discipline. Uh, interdisciplinarity, when, for instance, you teach environment and in this way uh, you try to uh, teach uh, environment through um, a disciplinary approach, I mean, uh, through the point of ecology or through the point of view of geography, of history, etc. And transdisciplinarity, STEM education is a transdisciplinary approach. Why? Because uh, it brings the creation of the different disciplines, it combines at the same time, many cognitive disciplines, and this is the magic of STEM, uh, integrates the disciplines in a harmonious manner to construct new knowledge. Nowadays, we talk a lot about uh, integrated STEM is a new uh, concept, which is this effort to, uh, to combine um, science, technology, engineering, mathematics into a class that is based on connections between subjects and real world problems. And this is inspired by the philosophy of makerspace. Um, uh, Maker space includes all these uh, new trends. We talk about labs uh, that offer, for instance, 3D printers uh, or uh, other accessories and help students create things with their hands. Uh, so make, uh, assemble, and disable things. In here, we need to clarify the types of STEM. First of all, we have STEM and black. STEM and black is when we try to implement projects using the single DVD materials that you can find in your house, such as uh, a cardboard or uh, Lego or uh, anything uh, simple and inexpensive. Um, and uh, this uh, does not require so all the use of uh, uh, technology, but uh, it should uh, um, follow the computational thinking model. The second part, uh, the second category of STEM is what we call uh, this uh, computational thinking. Um, it's a model uh, which uh, should be integrated in school. Uh, computational thinking involves solving authentic problems, design systems, and understanding human behavior by drawing the concepts fundamental to computer science. Um, and uh, this is contained in most elements of problem solving that educators are constantly teaching the students. For instance, even teachers in kindergarten. Um, teach uh, computational thinking when, for instance, they have to teach students steps uh, and the steps in the process. This is a model of computational thinking. So, what are the components of computational thinking? Decomposition, how to solve a problem uh, involves solving the set of smaller problems. Pattern recognition, seeing new problems related to problems previously encountered. Abstraction, seeing the problem at different levels of details in algorithmic thinking to see tasks in terms of smaller, connected, discrete steps. Very, very important and very trendy in our days, the educational world, what we call physical computing. Uh, when, for instance, you ask your students to take measurements of pressure or humidity in, in, uh, in the classroom or in their house using Arduino or using Raspberry or any other device, um, this is called physical computing because this combines digital elements with the real world. And in this way, it develops a communication between the physical world and the digital world of the computer. Um, so physical computing takes the computational concepts into the real phenomena so that the students can use them in an authentic uh, environment. And um, however, the pedagogical stages of learning according to this, uh, when we have to think computationally, is uh, um, learners are engaged in physical computing and black making, tinkering, and remixing. 
Um, making is what I said before about the maker space, how we learn to work with things, make things, take things apart. In this way, uh, students engage in practices such as prototyping and pasting products, methodologies made used, for instance, by engineers. Tinkering, tinkering is uh, how to encourage students to use materials as tools to represent, to implement the dimensions of computational thinking. And the computer programming software for children are uh, useful for tinkering. Do we all know about Scratch for Arduino? Uh, or is it Java simulations, Raspberry? Are also these platforms, uh, uh, these tools are considered very sensitive to implement tinkering. And these uh, um, tools can enable students to see easily the connection between changes in the program and the corresponding changes in uh, um, the data received from uh, uh, physical uh, 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 real world. Um, and what the education technologies that we promote some education we all know about the virtual reality and how this uh, immersive technology uh, is very important in classroom. Uh, clickers with keypads, with classroom MOOCs, Internet of Things, and now they will talk also about Internet of Me, which contains wearable technologies such as smart uh, clothes, smart watches, um, smart classes. And these uh, um, uh, tools have uh, many pedagogical applications uh, in uh, education and the cloud computing, which can help us, uh, teachers to create a whole, um, simulate a whole virtual world. We talk about you know, the techniques or strategies, especially when we did science, so hands-on learning, mini labs, uh, virtual science, or a bit building models, crossover learning, out of learning. When you have one, for instance, you want to teach environment, it's very important to take your students and go outside and implement um, outdoor learning. Because in this way, they learn uh, to, to be um, close to the nature, they will learn to respect better the environment. Field trips, uh, context-based uh, learning and field uh, learning, science clubs, science exhibitions, it's important to, uh, it's interesting and challenging for students to organize all these uh, uh, activities. Um, and of course, let's not forget that uh, very important, the, the importance of multi-sensory uh, multimedia approach, that means that we need to use visual uh, aids, such as graphic organizers, uh, thinking maps, uh, visual clues, and anything that has to do uh, with uh, play-based learning, especially in primary education. For instance, uh, storytelling, role play, primary education is very important when we teach uh, science. Um, so, um, <clears throat> apart from this, STEM is related to community. I want to say something which is important. For instance, this one, this project that you see here, is a project created by students, primary school students in Greece. So these uh, students, primary students, uh, created some classes uh, for uh, uh, which are addressed uh, to students with visual impairment problems. Uh, they created these classes using Arduino, so we talk about STEM. Uh, they created in a, a small uh, company, uh, so students divided the roles. One was the graphic designer, the other was uh, uh, a producer, other one was a director, etc. So they learned about the binary, they, they learned how to develop the binarial skills. And uh, at the end, they reached out to the community to sell this product. So we talk about the product that contains STEM, contains the binarial skills, uh, contains community based learning. This is also another new trend now, uh, worldwide. And uh, here we can see. Uh, at the same time, uh, the human dimension, because I forgot to say that uh, the experts of the fourth industrial revolution tells us that this has failed because we have ignored the human factor. So when we talk about the fifth industrial revolution, the uh, human factor should be at the forefront of any, of any change. Um, here we need to clarify also uh, to emphasize the uh, gender gap stem because we all know that uh, still uh, the number of young women pursuing many STEM subjects is lower than that of the male counterparts, and this results in a STEM workforce with uh, low representation. Uh, so we need energy action in order to inform students uh, and attract uh, girls in this. Um, and, uh, um, we better, of course, and the education institutions play a huge role about this. Um, so now, uh, I was saying before, I'm still, 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 still
many workshops and lectures. When we try to a specific knowledge and strategic designs, it is applied to the What is the limit with the scientific method or help them present them specifically to increase the case of the system and prayers? And I try to adopt uh, usually an eclectic or mixed model to create elements from various learning fields, biological as I said before. <laughs> Um, and now, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, uh, why is intelligence? Intelligence is what makes us human. AI is an extension of that uh, quality. So, technological advancement is driving changes in many industries. Um, AI technologies are passing and create solutions one thought of impossible. Uh, so, uh, especially okay. for the this will be the foundation. Uh, regardless of age, we are constantly developing our understandings, and as our collective team. Improves. We are beginning to read machines that have human like abilities to learn and make strategic decisions. Uh, so, when we talk about uh, uh, AI, it's not, of course, an entirely new technology or a subject to discuss. Many novels from the past science fiction have predicted its rise to popularity. Uh, so far, AI hasn't made uh, any such way, crazy waves, but in many ways um, has uh, quietly become ubiquitous in uh, numerous aspects of our daily lives. From intelligent sector, sensors that help us uh, take perfect pictures, to the automatic parking features in cars, um, to our uh, personal assistance with smartphones, AI um, uh, of one kind or another is all around us all the time. Uh, and why we may see not see uh, humanoid robo robots uh, uh, acting as teachers within the next decade. There are many projects already in the works that use of computer intelligence to help students and teachers get more out of educational experience. Uh, so um, we could say that AI is one of the most disruptive techniques to customize the experience of different learning groups and tutors. It's not just as we in the way teachers can do the jobs, it is also revolutionizing the way students learn. Uh, so what is AI will know that uh, this branch of science producing the study of the machine same the stimulation of human intelligent processes. And this is related also with machine uh, learning. And uh, uh, of course, uh, um, we talk about uh, um, um, uh, a big uh, um, uh, rise in uh, the education markets. We talk about uh, um, billion dollars in 2021, uh, and this is expected to grow. So, uh, what, uh, why uh, AI can transform educational sector? Um, we all know that uh, a lot of time is spent by teachers um, in administrative activities like grading and assessment of works. So the use of AI in education can help automate the grading and assessment of activities like multiple choice questions or between uh, blanks, etc. Um, and uh, uh, this automation of administrative activities means that teachers can spend more time with the students so they could make the learning process more efficient. More personalized, differentiated, individualized learning um because uh, um uh, for instance um they um this it could be a universal solution to get a set of tools tailored to the specific needs of learners educators to optimize their routine to increase their efficiency to improve accessibility uh, there are several companies like um uh Carnegie learning for instance i can mention that currently develop intelligent instruction design and digital platforms that use ai to provide learning testing and feedback to students from pre-k to college level that gives them the challenges that are ready for identifies gaps in knowledge and redirects to new topics when it's needed so as ai uh, uh, becomes more sophisticated uh, it might be possible for a machine to read, for instance, the expression that passes on a student's face that indicates that they are struggling to grasp a subject and uh, uh, this uh, way they can, uh, teachers can modify a lesson to respond to this. 
Um, and uh, this way, um, educational uh, uh, software um, can be adapted to student needs, uh, systems respond to the needs of students. Uh, and uh, uh, AI can assure that educational software is our uh, personal life. This uh, kind of um, custom tailored education could be a machine assisted solution to help the students at different levels work together in one classroom. Um, so we talk about the universal access for students because this can make global, uh, can help make global available to all, including those who speak different languages or who might have visual or hearing impairments. Um, and this um, opens up possibilities for students who might not be able to attend school due to illness or those who require uh, learning at a different level. It's something which is accessible by all students. Um, uh, and uh, 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 it's interesting here to talk about the smart uh, content creation because uh, AI can help us learn, uh, create learning content updates, create digitalized uh, textbooks um, uh, to, um, it's something that uh, changes the role, uh, of course, of teachers um, and uh, uh, helps identify classroom uh, weaknesses. Um, tutoring also, it's important that uh, the classroom, uh, there are many more AI applications now that are being developed, including AI mentors for learners, further development of smart content and new methods of personal development for educators through virtual global conferences, for instance. The role of constant constructive feedback also is important. Uh, AI can make trial and error learning less intimidating. Data part by AI can change how schools, for instance, find teachers and support the students. Uh, for instance, using the AI system software uh, and support, students can learn from anywhere in the world at any time. And with these kinds of programs, um, 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 this uh, could be very uh, efficient. And uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, altering the way how we find and interact with uh, um, information. So these changes to where students learn, who teaches them, and how they acquire the basic skills. Um, I will talk about global learning because uh, education has no limits. AI can help eliminate boundaries. Uh, AI powered education equips students with fundamental, of course, IT skills. So, we talk about new efficiencies because AI improves processes and IT processes and um, unleashes new efficiencies. Um, and uh, schools can define the proper methods of preventing schools, for instance, uh, from getting lost in crowds when they run corridors. We talk about uh, brand new efficiencies and many, many new perspectives that are going to be unleashed. Um, and uh, um, what are the things to consider before AI you need to identify the role of AI in schools, all the, to, to consider the key processes that the use of AI in schools will automate. What are the challenges of teaching AI in schools? So what are the ways to overcome them? How to align AI with the existing environment in school? How to make a transition process? Uh, smoother and how to use the end schools uh, in order to provide actionable insights for effective decision making. So before you try to implement AI in, in classrooms, we need to identify the needs of AI technologies to define the strategic objectives uh, of uh, AI transformation in the organization, to make the right cultural talent and technology meet, to invent and think about smart ways to control the outcome of AI transformation. Nothing can replace a teacher, however, um, uh, technology can expand the teaching. How AI can be used uh, in um, K-12 education, uh, we can uh, mention uh, the case of um, uh, intelligent tutors of reading uh, workshops, translator, uh, translation capabilities, um, low vision accessibility, uh, with some examples. And it's interesting to see what happens in higher education. Um, according to surveys, um, uh, we have this uh, big rise in the share of the new AI PhDs. Um, and um, for instance, in the European Union, the vast majority of specialized AI academic offerings are taught at the master's level. Robotics formation is by far the most frequently taught course in the specialized bachelor's and master programs, while machine learning dominates the specialized short uh, courses. 
So, of course, this is the future uh, in higher education also. Uh, we can see some examples of uh, AI uh, educational applications, for instance, Aquarium, use AI to deliver customizable uh, STEM tutorial lessons to high school and college uh, uh, students. Um, we have a case, for instance, for GitHub's uh, Adaptive uh, Learning Pro platform, which contains algorithms can help education institutions collect data and increase learning uh, engagement. Uh, Blippers products that combine computer uh, vision intelligence technology augmented reality. Uh, we have uh, all know about Quizlet. Um, uh, this platform uses machine learning data for millions of study sessions to show students the most relevant study material. And uh, we have also uh, many um, useful and precious uh, educational applications in special education, very important, that can help. Uh, um, student special education needs uh, to learn a better, more challenging way. What are the fears uh, of uh, AI? Well, no, this is uh, usually the general anxiety um, of um, uh, AI that um, this will be, um, will replace uh, in the future teachers. Uh, this is a myth, uh, we don't know about this. Uh, this is um, rooted in the idea of mass unemployment of human workers due to the replacement by AI workers. Uh, <clears throat> what are the ethical boundaries of digital life forever? Um, what we call super intelligent, because uh, probably I think the biggest fear of AI making media waves is that of super intelligence or that uh, AI will reach a point where it doesn't care for or about the existence of humanity anymore. Uh, so the fear is that the technology will get to, to a point where it can teach itself and improve and invent on its own. And instead of becoming a force for the betterment of humanity, humanity becomes a servant of a technology. Uh, so the fear is actually that our brain will just not be able to keep up with advancement, development and invention after a certain point because things will be moving way too uh, faster. Um, and um, in this, uh, within this framework, uh, we study uh, main camps of controversy here. There are techno skeptics about this. Uh, there are the digital utopians. Uh, this could try to welcome uh, AI technology and uh, uh, but, uh, those who are skeptical about it. And they are uh, the beneficial movement, those who are um, in favor of this uh, movement. So before concluding, we can say that um, apart from this, um, what about this? Um, that, um, wait a minute. Um, there is a philosopher, uh, philosopher Luciano uh, Floridi that uh, reminds us of several other developments in history that threatened to diminish human uh, dignity. Um, we can see how uh, Nicolas Copernicus, for instance, or the, uh, Charles Darwin, or Sigmund Freud, Alan Turing, um, how they dethroned humanity from uh, an imagined central uh, uh, universal centrality, and how they destabilized the prevailing and long held uh, anthropocentric view of nature. How uh, Copernicus showed that we are not at the center of the universe. Darwin showed that we are not at the center of the biosphere. Freud showed that we are not at the center of the psychosphere, and uh, uh, this, of course, uh, blows very easy to take. Um, this uh, needs time in order for uh, humans to be adapted. Uh, when we talk about uh, AI, this is domain specific. Uh, on the other hand, human intelligence is domain general. So before concluding, we can say that um, policymakers and educators have entered um, uh, uncharted territory that raises fundamental questions about uh, how the future of learning will interact with AI. In 2019, UNESCO, in cooperation with the government of uh, People's Republic in China, organized the National Conference on AI and Education in Beijing. And uh, this uh, recommends that um, UNESCO develop guidelines and resources to support the capacity building of education policy makers and the creation of AI um, skills. Um, you can find the uh, internet all these reports about this. This involves also gender equality and mainly 
The use of AI education must be guided by the core principles of inclusion and equity. Policies must promote equitable inclusive access to AI, the use of AI as a public good with a focus on empowering girls and women and disadvantaged socioeconomic groups. So um, the use of technology education will only benefit uh, all of humanity if it enhances human-centered approaches to pedagogy and respects ethical norms and standards. And AI should be geared to improving learning for every uh, student. Artificial intelligence is a tool, not a threat. Uh, this is some, some of my uh, in uh, uh, school. Uh, some, of my, uh, some of my workshops in uh, the gastronomy space company. Uh, and uh, uh, for all these uh, projects, I have uh, received so far over 200 awards, and I was uh, uh, selected among the best teachers in the world uh, with uh, a Global Teacher Prize by the Barker Foundation uh, and uh, a Global Teacher uh, Award for three consecutive uh, years um, by AKS uh, Education. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for your attention. And of course, if you need any uh, question, I am here uh, to discuss with you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Rania. And I am very enlightened with your book and with the concept of AI and how could I I apply it as a teacher towards my uh, into my teaching styles or towards my student. So to name VUCA is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So we uh, are living in the world of VUCA and is the world that we are living now where in changes is too fast according to Professor Rahe and which is also influenced by many difficult factors. So uh, these factors we need to innovate like the AI that we can apply in our classroom, we can apply in learning and to live with and to adapt with like Albert Einstein is for us uh, for us to uh, cope up with the changes of this uh, VUCA world, we need to have this measure of intelligence in the ability to change. Thank you, Professor Rania, for sharing your uh, wonderful talk this morning. And I am really looking forward to have my own AI soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to our participants, do you have any question? Okay, I guess uh, you elaborated it well, Doc, uh, Professor Rania. So maybe we need to proceed to our uh, recognition. Certificate of Recognition is awarded to Professor Raniel Danto for being the keynote speaker during the day two of the first international multidisciplinary webinar series of Authors and Writers Guild began books publication this August 26 to 28, 2022 with the theme, Rising Beyond the Pandemic, Ensuring Quality Life Towards Integral Development. Given this, I'm so sorry. 27th day of August 2022 20, at Makabebe Pamtanga. Signed, Dr. Yunhelo B. Caposo, Brian Books Publication, CEO Professor. Signed, Mensuari S. Bacolod, Authors and Writers Guild President. And signed, Dr. Mohaina SPDI, MPD, Faculty in the University of Indonesia. So thank you and congratulations to Professor Rangel Lempo. So now let me call in our... Thank you very much for this great opportunity. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, Professor. Dr. Leonila Capulso. Okay. 
Okay, let's give Professor Rania a virtual club. Participants, thank you. So now let me proceed to the next speaker. Our next speaker is a multi-awarded educator, researcher, writer, and author. He is a currently a master teacher one and acting assistant principal for operations and learner support in Buenaventura Alandi National High School, SDO Tayaba City. He is also the legal head and one of the board of directors of BN Books Publication and associate editor of International Journal of Advanced Multidisciplinary Studies. And he finished his Juris Doctor of Ma at Manuel is in Verga University Foundation Incorporated in 2018 and currently working on his dissertation writing at Southern Luzon State University with his degree in Doctor of Business Administration. Please help me welcome our next speaker, Joel and De La Cruz with a virtual club. Hello, good day everyone. I'm Joel M. De La Cruz, a master teacher one from Buenaventura Alande National High School in the schools division of Tayaba City and the legal head of the books publication. Allow me to thank first Beyond Books Publication, headed by the CEO and President, Dr. Yanilo P. Caposo, for this opportunity to share with you something about researches. The topic that is assigned to me was the overview of a research of, or of, of a quantitative research. So today, uh, we will be discussing the use of quantitative research. So to start with, let us first define the quantitative uh, research. So according to Bandari 2022, quantitative research is the process of gathering and interpreting numerical data. It can be used to identify trends and averages, formulate hypotheses, examine casualty, and extrapolate findings to a larger population. In addition, a quantitative research is uh, a method of uh, research that relies on measuring variables using a numerical system, analyzing uh, this measurement using any of the variety of statistical models and reforming relationships and associations among the studied variables. For example, these variables may be test scores or measurement of reaction time. So the goal of gathering uh, this quantitative data is to understand, describe, and predict the nature of a phenomenon, particularly through the development of models and theories. Quantitative research techniques include experiments and surveys. Research is uh, widely used in the natural and social sciences, in economics, sociology, biology, chemistry, psychology, marketing, and in any other field. So quantitative research method, so this method is uh, open use in descriptive and experimental and correlational researches. All researches may offer to dwell in any of the of this quantitative research. You may offer to 
descriptive research, uh, which you are looking at the overall overview of your study variables. Or you may use experimental systematically and check to see if the in the given variables uh, there is on its relationship. This is about the study of uh, loss and effect relationship. And the other use for relation is to look into between the variables you are studying. Say you are comparing uh, two variables and see if there is a relation uh, between this two. So at the end of uh, your research, uh, you will see if there is a direct relationship uh, between this variables and how they are uh, being connected. In the quantitative research method, so there are several you may choose to utilize experimental. So in experimental quantitative research, this is how uh, you assess the dependent variable's impact on the dependent variable. So you must have um, control over the the, the variable uh, being assessed. So in experimental research, uh, for example, on intervention uh, that can improve, let's say, the academic performances in mathematics among grade seven learners. You might develop an intervention material and uh, make use by your uh, students or a group of students and see um, how this intervention material change. Uh, let's say the performances of your students after its use. So another is you make use uh, a survey. So in a quantitative research, uh, you may ask a group of people questions in in person, over the phone, or online. So for example, you are handing out a questionnaire with rating skills for uh, senior high school leaders to determine the perceptions on the career exam program of the school. In the Philippines, there are exits or career exits for the uh, senior high school. They may opt to go to college. They are wish to continue their education, or they may opt to go into entrepreneurship entrepreneurship, they engage in themselves in business, or they engage themselves into employment or even in middle skills. So you may use a survey to determine their perceptions on uh, the different career exceeds which uh, one of those uh, interactions in uh, the career exit program they may opt to choose. Another is uh, a systematic observation. This is uh, finding uh, an interesting action or occurrence in, uh, in, its, uh, in its natural environment. For example, you observe a senior high school classes uh, while sitting in on them to count and record frequency of active and behaviors by learners uh, from various backgrounds. So uh, by using an observation, um, you may also uh, learn uh, the, the different uh, techniques uh, in gathering uh, the data. So you may want to, uh, instead of uh, the use of experimental and uh, the absorbing method. And the other uh, method that you may uh, choose to use is a secondary research. 
So a secondary research is uh, the gathering and information that has already been uh, available. Uh, it is already been uh, gathered, such as uh, a historical records or a national service. Uh, for instance, in the university, uh, you may, they may use or they mostly use uh, the data they gathered for uh, primary uh, primary research in business. Uh, in however, go to educational institutions and uh, ask for information. Uh, from them to get the, the necessary data that they are needing in the current study. Um, secondary research also um, is much more cost effective uh, than a primary, uh, primary research. As it is made use of, uh, of, of uh, already existing data. So, unlike the primary research where data is collected well, firsthand by the organizations or businesses, or they can employ a third party to collect data uh, on their behalf. So, in the, in the research, um, the data may be available uh, using the internet. This is a way of platform in which researchers uh, may look into. So uh, there are a lot of available data now in the uh, internet. Uh, maybe go to websites, uh, particularly those published in the uh, journal uh, the different publications. Uh, another is uh, uh, the government and uh, non-government agencies where data are available. Another is public libraries. So researchers may go to uh, public libraries and do their uh, research there and uh, maybe browse on uh, the different uh, uh, published articles and uh, uh, so that are available in the uh, public library. So another is uh, educational institutions. There are a lot of uh, previous researches published, uh, unpublished thesis, uh, dissertations, and uh, case studies, and the likes. So they may uh, look into uh, those published and unpublished uh, researches uh, that are stored in the uh, um, institutions. Another is uh, commercial information sources. So uh, researchers can look uh, also in the local papers, uh, journals, magazines, radio and TV stations, uh, which are a big source of also of uh, uh, data for uh, secondary uh, research. So a quantitative data analysis uh, before uh, data can be evaluated, it might be need uh, to be processed uh, once it is uh, acquired. So in a quantitative data, we make use of a statistical analysis. We might um, be necessary to convert uh, test and survey results uh, from words uh, to numbers. Most likely, in quantitative data, we use uh, a statistical treatment to arrive at the uh, interpretation and in the discussion of our uh, results of the data gathered. So, like any qualitative uh, data analysis, uh, we're in the answers uh, from the interview, from uh, the recorded data that we gathered from uh, the interview. So, and uh, there, is, there is less methods uh, in quality of data analysis, but in quantitative data uh, analysis, so the statistical uh, treatment is being uh, used. You can also get a summary of your data by uh, using a descriptive statistics. So in quantitative methods, so there are uh, two uh, statistics uh, being used. One is uh, the descriptive uh, 
which also uh, includes the averages and measures of variability. Uh, commonly, we use the measures of the central tendency. Uh, we look uh, somehow on the, the mean, uh, the mean and the mode or even the, the variability you know, um, of the, the results. So additionally, uh, you may uh, visualize your data and look for uh, trends or uh, what we call the outliers uh, using graphs, scatter plots, and frequency tables. Uh, most likely when you browse on uh, a publish uh, researches, uh, thesis, and dissertation, uh, in the discussion part, you may um, see uh, graphs, scatter plots, and uh, frequency uh, tables to represent uh, the results of your uh, of the data. So this is how um, quantitative data uh, using the descriptive statistics are uh, being presented. Another statistical tool uh, that is used in the quantitative data is the inferential statistic. So in inferential statistic, we deduce conclusions or generalizations uh, from the data. Uh, we test uh, if uh, the jury or uh, our estimated population uh, parameter uh, using the sample data. Uh, in inferential statistics, uh, we use uh, to test the, the hypothesis. And so if there is a correlation or if there is a significant difference on the variable that we use in our study. In a qualitative data, uh, we, we somehow use the, uh, uh, the assumption or uh, we use also hypothesis. Uh, in all researches, um, maybe you may use a hypothesis, and a, but in not all uh, instances um, that research uh, may use uh, inferential uh, statistics. So let us now go to uh, the advantage of a quantitative research. Uh, the first advantage of uh, a quantitative uh, research is that uh, it can be replicated and also, or the data uh, can be re uh, replicated. So it must be uh, repeated and, or um, your study may be replicated by uh, future researchers. In uh, data replication, repeating the study is, uh, is possible no? because uh, of the standardized uh, data collection. Uh, protocols and uh, tangible definitions of uh, abstract concept. So uh, in research, we it, it can be uh, replicated since a research is uh, somewhat uh, uh, cyclical. So others may look into other variables which are not included in your uh, research. So another advantage is uh, the direct comparison of results. So uh, the study can be reproduced uh, in other cultural settings, times, or with different groups of participants. And results can be compared uh, statistically. Another is large samples. So data from uh, large samples can be processed and analyzed using a real, reliable and consistent procedures through quantitative uh, data analysis. So in a quantitative research, um, to make it reliable, we used to have a large sample of data. So that represents uh, the whole populations of our chosen uh, respondents. Another is uh, a hypothesis testing. So this is uh, in relation to uh, the inferential statistics. In our research, we used to test uh, whether there is uh, a correlation on the variables that we use in our study or if there is a significant difference uh, between the variables uh, that we are employed in our 
uh, care and study. Of course, if there are advantages of uh, a quantitative research, there are also disadvantages. So one is the super uh, superficiality. So using uh, precise and restrict uh, restrictive operational definitions may inadequately uh, represent complex uh, concepts. Uh, for example, uh, the concept of uh, mood uh, may be represented with just a number in a quantitative research, but explained with elaborate uh, elaboration in a qualitative uh, research. Of course, there are restrictions in the use of a quantitative data. So we might not get uh, the uh, best representation um, that's why other researchers are opted to make use of a um, mixed method, the combination of a qualitative and a quantitative uh, research method to uh, really have a uh, definite and clear um, presentation of uh, the results of uh, the conducted research. Another disadvantage of a quantitative research, it's uh, narrow focus. So uh, predetermined variables and uh, measurement uh, procedures can mean that uh, you ignore other uh, relevant information. Uh, because some, uh, in a quantitative research, we primarily focus on uh, the variables that we adopted in our research and somehow neglected some other relevant information that should be included in our uh, pre present study. Another disadvantage is a structural bias. So a structural bias, uh, despite the standardized procedures, a structural uh, biases can still affect a, uh, a quantitative research. Um, just like, for instance, there are uh, missing data, uh, imprecise measurement of inappropriate sampling methods uh, are biases you know, uh, that can lead uh, to our wrong conclusions. And uh, the last uh, disadvantages of a quantitative uh, research uh, is the lack of uh, context. So quantitative research open uses a natural setting like uh, laboratories or uh, fails to consider uh, historical and co uh, cultural context that may affect uh, data collection and uh, results. So uh, basically in um, uh, quantitative research, uh, we somehow um, have a uh, lack of uh, of context, uh, especially in uh, in the contents you know, of our our research study. Uh, but of course, uh, it it's up to uh, the researchers uh, which among the uh, the method is uh, convenience uh, for them. Uh, you may they may opt to. Uh, use the quantitative research uh, if they are uh, really inclined into um, having the reliability and you know, using uh, uh, survey, for instance, a survey uh, uh, a questionnaire. Um, others may opt to uh, make the other uh, method, just like the, the qualitative. Um, to get the, the direct uh, information uh, from their participants. So um, uh, for the uh, lack of time and the restrictions on uh, the given uh, time for, for us uh, to discuss more about uh, our topic, I am uh, uh, thankful uh, to uh, Beyond Books Publication for uh, giving this opportunity and share with you uh, uh, a brief um, summary and uh, 
uh, insights on uh, the overview of uh, quantitative research. So somehow it is uh, or it gives you um, an idea on uh, the use of a quantitative research, its um, uh, drawbacks and its uh, advantages. You know? um, Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for uh, for listening, and I hope uh, that you get a uh, gist uh, from my uh, discussion, and it will help you uh, in uh, starting your uh, uh, research study. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, for listening. And uh, before I uh, formally end my, my talk, uh, let me share to you a quotation from uh, Nate Silver uh, that uh, he says that the key uh, to making a good forecast is not in limiting yourself to quantitative information. Uh, once again, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, keep safe and uh, happy uh, researching, uh, everyone. Thank you so much and uh, have a blessed uh, blessed day, everyone. Wow. So interesting. From the talk of our speaker a while ago by Professor Garcia to our uh, current speaker, Dr. De La Cruz, I am very glad that I learned a lot from the advantages and the disadvantages you have presented now. So in light of that, I would like to read a certificate of recognition to Joel and De La Cruz for being one of the plenary speakers during the day in Philippines, Tagum Mabini Campus at Tagum Davao del Norte. He completed his Bachelor of Theology at Christ the King Seminary of the Eastern Visayas Independent Catholic Church at Padre, Bo Padre Burgos, Southern Lady Philippines. He currently working at Limas Elementary School, Coast Division of Davao de Oro, Davao Region of the Department of Education with head teacher three position. Further, he also designated as the district uh, research coordinator in La Ac North Schools Division at Davao de Oro, Davao, Philippines. He was serving in the division as division trainer for two school or fiscal years. More so, he affiliated as one of the working committees and particularly designated in the accreditation unit of Bayan Books Publication, Publish Research, which may be awarded with Certificate of Publication. During his education in the graduate school program, he elected as graduate school president for two terms, in particularly on year 2017 to year 2022. He was nominated for leadership award at the end of the first term as president and uh, he is a president of a non-government organization named Nabalika TV Communicators Association in Mindanao Region Incorporated. Moreover, he earned her three training certificates from Simeo Enotech and awarded the same organization institution of Joint Diploma Award this year. Let uh, Please help me welcome and let us give him a virtual clap, Mercy Jane Cuesto and Cleo. Hello and good afternoon to all who are viewing or participating in our lecture series. I am your presenter. Once again, Merson James Kistikleo would like to give you a lecture on the for this plan. And before we will continue to the um, topic that we are to present now, so allow me first to uh, give you a saying which is about 
from the book of Proverbs chapter 27 verse 12 in the New Living Translation. Particular to our preparation in a particular disaster, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. The primary goal of preparedness is to avert the loss of lives and assets due to threats and emergencies. According to Republic Act 10 121, which defined preparedness as the knowledge and capacities developed by governments, professional response and recovery organizations, communities, and individuals to effectively participate, respond to, and recover from the impacts of likely imminent or current hazard events of or or conditions while essentially implementing the preparedness is before any hazard or any disaster strikes preparedness outcomes straddle between pre-disaster disaster and post-disaster phases based on existing definitions Hello and good afternoon to all who are viewing or participating in our lecture series. I am your presenter. Once again, Merson James Kistikleo would like to give you a lecture on disaster preparedness plan. And before we will continue to the um, topic that we are to present, Recording in progress. series. I am your presenter. Once again, Merson James Kistikleo would like to give you a lecture 
on disaster preparedness plan. And before we will continue to the um, topic that we are to present now, so allow me first to uh, give you a saying which is about from the book of Proverbs chapter 27 verse 12 in the New Living Translation, particular to our preparation in a particular disaster. A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. The primary goal of preparedness is to avert the loss of lives and assets due to threats and emergencies. According to Republic Act 10.121, which defined preparedness as the knowledge and capacities developed by governments, professional response and recovery organizations, communities and individuals to effectively participate respond to and recover from the impacts of likely imminent or current hazard events of or or conditions while essentially implementing the preparedness is before any hazard or any disaster strikes preparedness outcomes straddle between pre-disaster disaster and post-disaster phases based on existing definitions the objectives of the National Disaster Preparedness Plan, or NDPP, emanates from the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Plan, or the NDRRMP. The NDPP helps the national and local governments and other governments or stakeholders to contribute to the following objectives. Number one, or first, increased level of awareness and enhanced capacity of communities to participate, avoid, reduce, and survive the threats and impacts of all hazards. Second, Fully equipped communities with the necessary skills and capability to
Recording give us stopped. the time and later you will receive the, uh, the form for the attendance for you to receive your certificate. I'm so sorry and stand Hello and good afternoon to all who are viewing or participating in our lecture series. I am your presenter. Once again, Merson James Kistikleya would like to give you a lecture on disaster preparedness plan. The primary goal of preparedness is to avert the loss of lives and assets due to threats and emergencies. According to Republic Act 10.121, which define preparedness as the knowledge and capacities developed by governments, professional response and recovery organizations, communities, and individuals to effectively participate, respond to, and recover from the impacts of likely imminent or current hazard events of or or conditions, while essentially implementing the preparedness is before any hazard or any disaster strikes, preparedness outcomes straddle between pre-disaster, disaster, and post-disaster phases based on existing definitions. The objectives of the National Disaster Preparedness Plan, or NDPP, emanates from the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Plan, or the NDRRMP. The NDPP helps the national and local governments and other governments or stakeholders to contribute to the following objectives. Number one, or first, increased level of awareness and enhanced capacity of communities to participate, avoid, reduce, and survive the threats and impacts of all hazards. Second, fully equipped communities with the necessary skills Hindi na naman po marinig po yung speaker. I'm so sorry, sir. Hello, sir. Hi, Doc Ecleo. Uh, we can't hear you. Hello po, Ma'am Angel. Um, yes, ma'am. Can Allow you? me to ask, po, yes. kasi actually the internet uh, at this hour is fluctuating. So can I um, request again to for you to play in, on your end po my my video? Similar po kasi, Doc, yung nagpresenta ko kanina, wala din audio po. Can ah, okay. you just give us the address na lang po, Doc, uh, itong city building, uh, your description or explanation maybe. Kasi uh, yes, parang po, dito lang po talaga nag, 
stop yung ano presentation mo at, at walang audio po, siguro talaga. Ah, okay po. So, I understood okay. po and hopefully I can um go back to the track po. So, okay. I should beg pardon to our participants. So, allow me to prepare for a second. Hello and good afternoon to all who are awareness is before any hazard objectives. Number one, the RRM and climate change adaptation or coordination among all key players of the and all governments and other governments. Hello, am I online po? Yes, but Doc, loud and clear. Okay, so I am on the next slide. So, and hello, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, here I am. So uh, once again, I am your presenter. So let's proceed to this slide concerning the five countries that has been hit for a lot of disasters according to the record of the 2018 and from previous 2014 results. Five countries most frequently hit by natural disasters as authored by Jonathan Kinghorn, the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters publishes an annual disaster review to provide valuable information on the occurrence of natural disasters and their impacts on society. The latest edition covers 2014 and it identifies China, the United States, the Philippines, Indonesia, and India as the five countries most frequently hit by natural disasters. For years now, these same countries have regularly featured and it is because we are situated on this location in the Southeast Asia and this is one of the most crucial aspect of being in the Philippines. So allow me to justify why we are part of that top five. Number one is location. First, in the United States is perfectly situated to receive many of the storms that occur in the Atlantic when it is not going through a lengthy hurricane drought. So it's different coming from the U.S. and the Philippines. And a significant portion of its west coast lies within the circum-Pacific belt sometimes known as the Ring of Fire, which is the most earthquakes in the world take place. Both China and the Philippines are vulnerable to earthquake activity and are in path of typhoons moving westward. The 6,000 inhabited islands of Indonesia are situated between the Alpine Belt and the Circum-Pacific Belt. The two seismically active regions in the world and as a result, these islands are subject to some of the planet's most destructive earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. Due to its position 
India is susceptible to tropical cyclones, which can be um, which can produce strong winds and significant rainfall that resulted in flooding thousands of kilometers inland. And the most frequent type of natural disaster in India is flooding. Another reason of being belong to top five for the previous years from 2014 to 2018 results is that in the United Sta States, we can say that there is a size factor and it comes in third on the list in terms of land mass, followed by China in fourth, India in seventh, and Indonesia in 14th. But concerning Philippines, we are ranked 67th, but it's more than 7,000 islands cover a sizable amount. Given all other factors being equal, larger countries will often experience more disasters than smaller ones. For instance, no country encounters more typhoons than China, which is partly attributable to the length of its coastline, which makes it a potential target. And the third reason is about resilience and insurance. In the United States, as a wealthy country that has made investments in a variety of measures to help it survive the effects of large natural catastrophes and recover rapidly, but it has also a very high economic vulnerability to natural disasters. It has a strong economy, solid governance, established infrastructure, efficient mechanisms for preparing for and responding to disasters and strict building codes that are consistently followed. Additionally, advantages are the high insurance penetration rates. On the other hand, growing economies like China, the Philippines, India, and Indonesia are all experiencing rapid economic growth that is surpassing their already constrained ability to resist the effects of catastrophic disasters. These are the nations most at risk from natural disasters. In these nations, insurance enrollment rates are typically very low. So based from the data in 2013, the property casualty market premium as a percentage of gross domestic product was 0.47 in India, 0.35 in the Philippines, 0.42 in Indonesia and 1.08 in China compared to 3.17 in the United States. According to AXCO Insurance Information Services, in 2013 also, the cost of property and casualty insurance per person was US dollar 7.43 in India and 9.70 US dollar in the Philippines, 14.52 in Indonesia and 72 four, and 46 US dollar in China, but there is 1,661.73 in the US. Key loss data from AIRS Global Industry Exceedance Probability or EP curve are detailed in the 2015 Global Model Catastrophe Losses Report. Based on the EP curve, it gives global insured and insurable loss predictions and emphasizes the difference between globally insured and insurable exposures. And in order to assist societies better prepare for disasters and lower the overall cost, economic loss estimates which have been included to this study can be used to support public risk financing and the creation of regional resiliency plans. And to add some more, there is other numerous risks combined. So another problem is the wide range of dangers that each of these five nations faces. Each is susceptible to landslides, wildfires, interior flooding, coastal inundation brought on by storm surge or tsunami, as well as earthquakes, and tropical cyclones, and among many other dangers. According to the annual disaster review, there are 324 natural occurring catastrophes were reported in 2014. 
which is the third lowest total recorded over the previous 10 years. And the Philippines and Indonesia are recorded modest totals, whereas China witness, witnessed a very, very high total. Disaster damage in, in the Americas was 62%, less than the region's annual average over the previous 10 years. The United States entered the top five because to several geophysical, hydrological, and meteorological disasters and drought rather than one or two catastrophic catastrophes. And on these slides, there is a question, what is a disaster preparedness plan? So this is one or the main topic that we need to discuss. So this is just basic um, information on the disaster preparedness plan. First is a disaster preparedness plan must have or must be a strategy that enables organizations to be ready for emergencies, including winter storms, tropical cyclones, wildfires, and droughts. It is a manual that details how to evacuate, recover, and go on with business or any school operations in the event of a disaster. In order to prevent serious business damages, it is utilized to protect workers and other business processes. Next, a disaster preparedness plan is a manual and that is our means to help us to evacuate and to recover, to go on and to prevent. And some more, we can use this manual in order for us to save our families. So the next slide will be the importance of our disaster preparedness plan. Number one is to determine the components that the disaster supply pack should have. So the 20 weather-related catastrophic events resulted in damages above 1 billion each in the United States alone, according to a 2021 analysis by the National Centers for Environmental Information, about 688 people died as a result of these incidents, which also had a substantial economic impact on affected areas. If organizations are ready for disaster, so with the aid of disaster preparedness plan, it is crucial to prepare and strategize in order to support organizations. And on the next importance is that a plan to restart operations as soon as a practice applicable or practicable. And the third is determine each person's role in the evacuation or restart of operations. The next, and according to the research that I have, and this is one of the framework or features of a disaster preparedness plan. So a plan must begin with assessing the risk. So requiring all the data that must be gathered. So there must be an objective gathering of data in order for us to really um, and truthfully um, achieve and get the risk. And after that, we have to develop a plan. And that developing a plan must address immediate priorities, including escape routes, first aid, and disaster preparedness kits. Ensure emergency equipment such as generators and emergency lights, which are reliable and efficient. Also, let us focus on a recovery plan to be able to run a continuous operation even when disaster strikes. Next, set a practice drill to execute the plan together with all employees to ensure readiness when a disaster occurs. It is recommended to set up training courses such as evacuation plan strategy to boost employee awareness and accountability. Next, we will follow understand emergency alerts. So let us check the possible type of disasters that may occur in the business's area and understand each alert level. Identify the process of how to keep informed 
and updated about the disaster during and after its strikes. It is important for us to consider because every now and then, the pag-asa can also give us the signal like the color coding. So we must be oriented on that. So next, communicate. Let us collaborate with other organizations to have a unified plan when a disaster occurs. Prepare contact details of government authorities for immediate reference when help is needed. And one of the municipalities in the Philippines also included um, the tarpaulin around the community areas to be um, conspicuous for the community people to really heed that something important numbers to call as hotlines. So let us consider on that also. So next, these are the disaster supply kit that we need to prepare. Um, first, water. Prepare at least two liters of water per person. Heavy gallon of water may not be able or may maybe not mobile for each of you. So consider such amount of water that are easily to be carried. Non-perishable food and snacks that are good for at least three days. Next, can opener if non-perishable food includes canned goods. Next, battery powered radio for you to be able to hear news or information that can be essential for your restart. And then, flashlight to give light during night observance and when electrical power is out. So in rural areas in the Philippines and even other areas in the whole world, mostly the problem is the electrical supply. So let us see to it that before the disaster will hit a particular place, we as community people have already prepared something to give us light in the night or any under circumstance. Next, extra batteries. Since we don't know when a particular typhoon or disaster or any type of calamity would last, so let us have extra batteries. Next, we have to consider the map of the area. So if you are a stranger there or newly established or newly um, migrated to that area, so please see to it that you are fully acquainted with the map or the, the real scenario or the real setting of your area where you live. So this is one of the most important thing to consider. The next first aid kit. So the first aid kit is common to those who really wanted to uh, of help, particular to most immediate um, need when wounds are are not um, you know indispensable when when disaster really hit on a particular area. So next, common medications. So you have to uh, make a ready kit for these common medications like paracetamol, um, um, yung amoxicillin if you're warranted to to have that. And antibacterial wipes, identification cards. So thank you for this slide from courtesy to I auditor. So next, let's follow to what to do when a typhoon occurs. So part of our plan is to be acquainted with these steps. Number one, leave the area. So that's the first step. Next, bring a disaster preparedness kit as employees evacuate to a safer area. So next, do not use do not use elevators. Use the stairs to go to a higher level and stay in an interior room that does not have windows or glass doors. Next, if there is flooding or flood warning, evacuate to higher area. And next, if employees are unable to evacuate and there is no flooding or warning, go to the lowest possible interior room that does not have windows or glass doors. So remember, if there is flooding, evacuate to higher area. If there is no flooding, go to the lowest possible interior room that does not have windows or glass doors. So that's the difference of um, particular to our uh, response to 
the disaster. Next, how to prepare for a typhoon. So be familiar with alert levels used in the area. So this is what uh, I have uh, discussed earlier. And one of the situations there in our locality is that there is a red, yellow, green, blue. So those are the familiar colors that we need to memorize. And each measure or inch or meter of the flood level or water level in our uh, bridges so let us see to it that there is also a corresponding alert level so the highest is alert level three and it will go in if it will go beyond that alert level so that is very uh, dangerous for us to stay so you must be familiar with that alert levels next develop an emergency evacuation plan so let us see to it that we will know the entrance and the exit of our rooms. Next, install a generator for power outages. So if we have generators, so let us um, prepare this device prior to the typhoon. So since uh, there are news or information that we can hear during uh, um, particular to news, so we have to um, see to it that we have generators of lighting for our electricity and among others. Next, cover all windows with storm shutters. So next, attend training on how to turn off the electrical power in case of flooding. So go to your um, National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Office or Council to give you hints or you can have your own research for that. So that is also important. So these are the things that you need to prepare. And to give you more, these are the 12, 12 ways to prepare. And this is based on the federal government of the United States that they, that they require us to check if you are there in the United States and maybe can be applicable also in some setting in the Philippines and among other countries. So first, Sign up for alerts and warnings. So that's very important. So you, you know the, the alert signs, the warning signs. So these are essential things to memorize and to orient with our fellow family members. So let us not be uh, the one who will know this information. But rather, let us give this information to our neighbors for them also to be informed. Next, make a plan. So in making a plan, you have to check if you have that plan, disaster and recovery plan, so you have also to share with your community. So in the Philippines, the lowest, um, aside from the family, the next um, um, community or group is Puro, followed by Barangay. So let us share this information by asking um, um, Warren to, to relay the information of this plan so that there will be a proper dissemination and communication on the higher authorities. So that's important. So check. Next, save for a rainy day. So just like ants, so they prepare before a particular... This means that like ants, they signal as human beings like old times. So to prepare foods prior to the rainy season, this ant story implies that we also should learn out from this lesson to prepare because preparation matters. Next, practice emergency drills. So are we practicing the earthquake drill, the fire drill in our area? So these are common in education sector. So these drills are essential to be taught in the community also prior to its strike of disaster. Okay, check that. So there must be all checks. So next, safeguard documents. So the best thing to do when you have these documents is to put it in a cellophane and make it sure that there are no holes there. And if in case of flooding, so you can prevent your, your documents from, from being wet. So you cannot make it waste. So these are important for you to consider. So your documents. Next, plan with neighbors. So as I can, I, I discussed earlier that when you make a plan, so include your neighbors. Check that. Make your home safer. 
So if, for example, in earthquake, so this is unpredictable event or disaster. So you have to check all your wirings, your, um, your building there, and see to it that there is a professional advice or technical advice coming from your municipality and check that. So that is um, that is that should be um, taken for granted. So next, no evacuation rats. So these are important in your area. Do you consider that there is also the knowledge of every citizen in the locality on the evacuation routes? Next, assemble or update supplies. So your supplies must be updated. So consider the expiry dates of each medical. Uh, supplies so it is also important because once it is expired it will make you harm so please consider also to check from time to time all your medical kits so that's important and check that next get involved in your community so for me as your speaker i i indulge myself i give myself to the community like being a member of a non-government organization for me to be able to share knowledge and, of course, gain knowledge for the upcoming. Um, I know that uh, unpredictable typhoons are unpredictable. Um, up to forecast, forecasted. Uh, however, these are the things that we need to consider. There are typhoons that can be um, more devastating, like Pablo previously, 2012, December 4. The people there or here in our locality did not really expect what a typhoon is. And for the first time, there are a lot of um, recorded uh, people who suffered from that disaster, including their, their houses and, of course, their, their lives of their family um, or their neighbors. So that's important to, to consider. You must get involved in your community in order to gain and to share knowledge. The last one, document and property. So please make it sure that you have to consider documenting and ensuring your property, especially on your, ca your, your cars, your houses. So actually, this aspect to check is quite um, unusual or uncommon in the Philippines. Maybe this is applicable to some countries on the documentation and the property. So, but I, but then again, try to consider this one on your own means. So, next slide. So, that's all. So, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you for bearing with my internet problem and to the internet glitch a while ago. So, God bless in Mabuhay and thank you to all of you. Yes, very wonderful presentation. Sir Merson Ecleo. So to briefly discuss what uh, Professor Merson James had discussed, he, uh, he discussed the preventions, precautions, and safety measure, uh, measure tips. Well, of course, you all know that preparedness is uh, the most uh, essential thing that we need to keep in our mind most especially like those devastating um phenomena that will hit not only in our country but also with the other countries experiencing as men as uh, experiencing as mentioned by doc so thank you very much uh doc mercy james Eclio. so now then therefore i will present to you Okay pa ba kayo dyan, mga participants natin? So I am really glad that still your energy and vigor at this moment still igniting our webinar, our first webinar, our multidisciplinary webinar, which is free given to us by our CEO and with the support of the members of this team. So with... This presentation of certificate to Merson James Cuesta Ecleo Eddy for being one of the plenary speakers 
during the day two of the first international multidisciplinary webinar series of Authors and Writers Guild, began books publication this August 26 to 28, 2022, with the theme Rising Beyond the Pandemic, Ensuring Quality of Life Towards Integral Development, given this 20th, 27th day of August 2022 at Makabe Pampa for Muhaina SPDI MPD faculty in the University of Achyarya Mandar, Indonesia, signed in Hello Bika Posa, PhD, our CEO president in Bian Books Publication, signed Mensuari S. Bakolod, Authors and Writers Guild President, and signed Professor Rania Lomto, Astronomy and Space Com Company, Athens, Greece. Thank you very much. Dr. Merson James Cuesta Eclio, and let's give him a round of applause, a virtual clap. Thank you, sir. And to our BN Books publication, let us not stop believing in this uh, one great opportunity that they are they had given to us, most especially that there is still a webinar tomorrow for day three. So looking forward for our closing remark that will be given to us by Professor Minsuwari S. Bakolod, our event chair. And for the attendance and to claim your certificate, I have here the link. Excuse me, ma'am. Hello? Okay, now let us welcome our event chair, Professor Minsuari S. Bakolet. You can now access our attendance for you to claim your certificate. Dr. Minsuari, hello po. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Okay, so I guess Naisulat na po ni Sir dito sa chat box natin. So thank you and goodbye. Let us pause for a moment for our closing prayer, by the way. Closing prayer. to pray. 
practice what we have discussed and learned. Help us to make a difference in this world for the glory of your name. Saint Paul, Saint Louis, Mariac, pray for.